Hello, my name is Brian Casey. I'm editor-in-chief of AntMini.com, and we're here at the 2018 edition of the RSNA meeting in Chicago. I'm pleased to have with us today Dr. Robert McDonald. He is with the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He's a neuroradiologist, and he's done uh, quite a bit of pioneering research into the issue of gadolinium retention from MRI contrast agents. Dr. McDonald, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So. Uh, I've noticed that there's been a lot of talks here at RSNA on the issue of gadolinium retention. What do we know right now, and uh, how big of an issue is it? Yeah, so obviously it's been in the press now for a few years, but still continues to be a hot topic. You know, I think what we've learned at this point over the last few years is that uh, gadolinium, uh, there's a small amount of uh, residual gadolinium that's left behind after every uh, every gadolinium enhanced MRI that's performed and what we also what we have learned is that the amounts vary between the different agents that we administer with the linear agents depositing slightly more than the macrocyclic agents. And when we say linear versus macrocyclic what are we talking about there? Right so the, there's different chemical structures even though all uh, what, what's called GBCAs or gadolinium based contrast agents are chemically similar they have some chemical differences so linear versus macrocyclic defines what the chelate structure what the ligand, what its, what its organic structure is, whether or not it, it encapsulates the gadolinium as a ring or whether or not it's open, which would be called linear. Okay. So um, recent studies have found that, that gadolinium, uh, trace elements of gadolinium uh, remain in patients for, in some cases, years after they've received their MRI scan. So is this uh, a health issue? Is this something we need to be concerned about? Well, I, I think, obviously, it, it, it merits further investigation uh, so far. Uh, much of the research suggests that there's no adverse health consequences from this uh, in terms of the controlled scientific studies that are out there, but it, they're still ongoing. And so it's, it's premature to say absolutely not, but I think we can, we can comment basically on, on what we know to date, which is we, we don't see that there's an adverse effect from the gadolinium retention. Now there are other issues like gadolinium, what's called gadolinium deposition disease. And right now we're still trying to learn what that is and what's causing it. And there are still people, including the FDA, who aren't certain that there's a causal relationship between gadolinium exposure and the occurrence of this phenomenon. But again, research is still ongoing. And it, it's, I, I read a study just a few weeks ago that questioned whether um, acute reactions to MR contrast should be associated with gadolinium deposition disease um, because they seem to be, they actually seem to be very uh, different things and they've kind of been getting confused with each other. Yeah, so I mean there's a few issues here. One of the concerns or questions that's oh, the open-ended questions about say gadolinium deposition disease is that it seems to occur so quickly it doesn't seem to be associated with what we're now acknowledging as deposition. And so it might be a misnomer to call it de gadolinium deposition disease. Uh, so again, but the causal association between the gadolinium exposure and these symptoms that are occurring sometimes minutes to hours afterwards, uh, that's something that's being investigated. And in terms of, of acute contrast reactions, well, I view that as a totally separate entity. Uh, we don't even know quite yet why these reactions occur uh, in terms of hypersensitivity reactions. Now those clearly occur very fairly quickly. Sometimes they're delayed by an hour, but they're not happening days to weeks later. Okay. Now you recently did a paper that uh, looked into the mechanism into why we think that gadolinium is getting into at least brain tissue in patients, and, and what did that paper uh, find? Yeah. So. Um, I think one of the evolving, one of the most important topics now is to understand the biodistribution of gadolinium. What happens after we inject it? Where does it go? And so what, that was part of our question was to understand uh, from a, from looking at the CSF how much gets into the CSF. This is the cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid, and, and what happens over time? So we looked prospectively. We we collected tissue from patients who had received as a lumbar puncture up to 30 days after they got a gadolinium enhanced MRI and measured the amount of gadolinium, uh, the residual gadolinium in uh, the CSF. And these were all from gadobutrol uh, uh, um, MRI enhanced exams. Uh, and so we wanted to understand 
uh, what, if, what sort of biodistribution occur, w would occur. And so what we found is that every patient who received uh, this GBCA gadobutrol, there was a measurable amount of gadolinium in their CSF. And from a 30,000 foot view, what we're trying to understand is how does it partition out after it gets injected into the blood into different tissues in the body? Because we're still trying to understand how it gets into the brain. Some, a small amount gets actually into the brain tissue. And this is one of the ways we think it might occur is by getting into the CSF, it could go through the glymphatic system and get into the brain parenchyma itself. And that's probably a serious issue. Well, we don't, we don't really we know. Don't know. Yeah. Okay. Um, what are you looking at here at RSNA in terms of uh, papers on, on gadolinium? Well, I try to look at all of them if I can. Uh, but you know, my my interest right now, in particular, is this biodistribution phenomenon, as well as any clinical effects. I, I would say those are the two most important points. If there's a third point, I would say is is chemical speciation. That's something that still is going to take uh, is still in its infancy to understand. And what what exactly does that mean? Sure. So, to understand um, the ill effects of gadolinium it's important to understand what form of it is being left behind in the body. There are chemical forms that would be considered to be less safe, and there's some chemical forms that would be considered more safe based on their biologic inertness. And, and really, we need to better understand what the chemical forms of these are to know if we should be concerned. Because it's quite possible that these are in a biologically inert form that'll just sit around for years. I know that sounds unsettling, but it, it might be completely okay. Any other thoughts for our watchers out there, uh, imaging sites, hospitals that are using gadolinium contrast? Any other thoughts on that? Um, well, you know, like I said, I think right now still the most important, uh, the most most important thing to do is if you feel a gadolinium enhanced MRI exam is necessary for your patient, I think it's completely safe to keep giving it. Okay, perfect. Good. All right. Well, Bob, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Signing off for AntMini.com. This is Brian Casey.